Afternoon all. I have a very exciting game for you today from last night. I was playing for Muswell Hill Chess Club against Wilson and Brent. I was playing against a strong junior, Dominic Ford, F O R D. Basically the thing with this game would be uh, running for cover. So I played E4 and Dominic played E5 and after knight F3 he played the Philidor defence. So I was quite, kind of pleased because it's not in my view that aggressive this opening. And I thought white can gain a small advantage just with d4. I don't really know much of the theory. Uh, I've seen one of Matt Pullin's excellent videos on it, on the Philidor, if you, if you want to check out this opening in more depth. Um, after knight f6, I played knight c3. And he played bishop e7. I was expecting actually maybe g6, a kind of dragon setup with g6, because I thought the bishop was kind of passive on e7 and also if black plays g6 the f5 square is not as easy to use for white and it's this second note which uh, prompted me for a very aggressive plan now to put my bishop on e2 to be able to play g4 because there's two points then that the knight can be reinforced more if there's a pawn on g4 and also of course you know trying to hack the opponent's king so after knight d7 he delayed casting maybe he sensed that I was preparing g4 I played it anyway, and you know maybe it is a very, very risky way of playing this because I'm attacking before I've finished development, before I've even castled, and this can sometimes backfire. Actually, in the game, it, it did almost backfire because I didn't play accurately to the way he countered this flank attack. He countered it with a classical, you know, a counter attack in the center. First, he attacked my center pawn on e4. So forcing me to play this passive f3, and now he played d5, and white has to play acrylic now to, to, to maintain an advantage. There's two key moves here which are much better than what I've played. What I played was g5. Before we look at that, let's look at these other two moves. So say e5, and the idea of this is that after knight d7, um, the reason I didn't like this, because I was just really thinking about bishop f4 or f4, I didn't like those positions you know, with the bishop h4 check. But actually, there's a much better move here. There's knight f5, because that bishop is temporarily, you know, lost contact with the f5 square. So if knight takes e5, for example, then this is going to be tasty for white. Bishop h6, and then queen takes d5. Lovely. You know, this check's harmless, and white will be much better in this kind of uh, position. So let's go back there after e5. And also, you know, there's, instead of e5 actually, bishop b5 check. This is another computer suggestion, uh, looking with Ribka. So say c6, knight takes c6, so sacrificing two pieces for the rook and pawns. And this is quite interesting. It's something I didn't really consider much. So after bishop takes, carrying on now the flank attack with g5. Because, you know, if the knight moves, say, say the knight moves, then knight takes d5. There's a lot of pawns. You know, four, I've, I've got four extra pawns now. And, you know, according to Ribka, white's much better here. And if he did want to sacrifice that knight now by playing d takes e4, this isn't as harmful as the game. Because after bishop takes bishop e3, you know, white, white's doing okay here. So anyway, I played the more dodgy move, g5. And this allowed a nice peace sacrifice by him, which very nearly worked. He just took on e4. So he's exposing the fact that I haven't castled yet. So it, it has the makings of a very dramatic game now. I, I snap up the piece and play bishop e3. But now I start to notice the horror of my position. After bishop h4 check, I can't simply play king f1 here. Let's have a look. If king f1, bishop h3 check, and now queen f6, a slow but killing move, because the threat now is queen g6. And look at my poor rook on h1, as well as my king. I can't really defend against this threat of queen g6. So, basically, in this position, I had to do something else, either bishop f2 or king d2. I chose, actually, king d2. And he took now on f3, and now played bishop g5. So he's stopping my king from evacuating safely to c1. And now he's also threatening queen takes d4 check, because of that pin. So, my troubles have just started. I defend the knight on d4. I think this is quite a good move. The computer likes it, anyway. So, after knight e6, 
Now, and only now, I take on g5. So I'm attacking his queen. So his queen, you know, he takes, and after king e1, thankfully his bishop's temporarily blocked from the h3 square. So basically, that gives me a chance now, after king, queen h4, to, to safely play king f1 to my relief. So if queen h3, bishop g2, for example, he played actually queen f6. And I thought this is starting to be okay for me now. Because, you know, how many pieces is he really attacking with? He's only got queen, knight, and bishop. And the bishop's blocked in at the moment. And I find the move king g2. Just reinforcing f3. Trying to reinforce now my tactical vulnerabilities to minimize them. After knight g5, I see another way of minimizing my vulnerabilities. Particularly f3, h3, and also control of the g5 square. All in one shot, I play the move h4. So I cover h3. I prompt, you know an exchange of that dangerous knight, and I cover the g5 square with my pawn. So I love to play that move. That is cheering me up now after this. And after bishop g4, here though I go wrong again. The most accurate move apparently is to play the move queen d3. What I played was knight g3. Let's have a quick look. Queen d3, if he castles here, then knight g5, threatening the crude mate in one. But it gives me a valuable tempo. Say bishop f5, then queen c3, and white to then fine. You know, say say you played though g6. Let's have a look at that. And then again, queen c3 w would would be okay, and that would be fine. In the game, you know, I made heavy work of this position again by playing another inaccurate move, knight g3. But thankfully, you know, my opponent started blundering now. After rook f1, he played an inaccuracy. He played rook f8 which really hasn't got much of a threat apart from rook e3 to try and exert more pressure on the pin. So that's what he played. But actually more accurate perhaps is rook a d8. And here, if queen c1, like in the game h6, so actually in the game continuation, after rook f e8, I, I thought queen c1 is a good move anyway. I don't need any prompting from rook d8, so I play it. Because I'm threatening maybe queen g5 now, and I don't have to worry about e2. And I really just want to cover the e3 square from his rook. So he plays queen c6 to my delight. A much stronger move is just h6. If he just plays h6 or even rook a d8, you know, h6 and I have to be quite resourceful to get my rook out of the game. Maybe a4 and rook a3 like we, we talked about that in post-mortem analysis. But you know with queen c6 all of a sudden the tables are turning now. He's got tactical vulnerabilities all of a sudden. His bishop can be attacked. His f7 pawn can be attacked. He was running short of time. It was a, a fast time limit in this um, this Middlesex Division 1 league. So maybe that explains why, you know, he's given me the, the attack now. After just sacrificing the c2 pawn, I can play rook f2. And now he plays bishop h3, trying to decoy my king away from the rook. So I just play king g1. And after queen c5, I'm developing even more attacking points with rook c1. So these are all attacking points now, vulnerabilities. The table has, has turned. After knight g5, and he's, he's forced to defend his bishop and f7 with bishop e6. So I just take on c7, and now I just take on e6 and take on f7. So I have two doubled rooks on the 7th rank. I've gained uh, my, a lot of pawns back. I'm just the pawn down for the piece. And after check, he just resigned here after knight f1. So I was really pleased to be able to recover from that game. But um, objectively, objectively, you know, I missed, you know, the more accurate moves wouldn't have put me in such hot water to start off with. Let's have a look in the game in overview and summary. Okay, I played e4, and after e5, he played the Philidor defense, and basically I played the ultra-sharp move g4. So I prompted a central reaction from him, which I didn't play the most accurate move, perhaps, which was either bishop b5 check or e5. My preference is actually e5 as the most accurate reply. So we, we had this very exciting game now with this peace sacrifice for two pawns and my king having to run for cover, which is the theme of the game. So after bishop h4 check, I played king d2, luckily, because king f1 and I would have been quickly slaughtered after bishop h3 check. And here I played another accurate move for survival, knight c e2. So after knight e6, I could take now on g5. And 
basically my king could run again to the king side for cover. And fortunately, after king g2, it seems as though some of my troubles were dissolving after this h4. But um, basically, if I had played queen d3, then that would have been much more pleasant than the game. After knight g3, though, he let me back in the game by playing a couple of inaccuracies. First, rook f e8, and now the big one, queen c6, losing control of that f4 square. So giving me the possibility now of f4, queen f4, just sacrificing the c2 pawn, getting my pieces into good positions and attacking his tactical vulnerabilities now. So that the tables turned and I was able to reach this easily winning position a piece up. So he resigned here. I hope you enjoyed that game. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.